Hello, everyone. The meeting will begin shortly. Uh, my name is John Pandolfino, and I'm the current president of the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society. And it's really my pleasure today to be introducing this session, The Pearls of Wisdom in Orectal Manometry. But before we start, we have a few announcements. First announcement is that we have our 2022 AMS annual meeting, our clinical course, which will be in Philadelphia on August 5th to the 7th. So please uh, make sure you sign up and participate. This is a really great course and the, the local organizing team in Philadelphia has done an amazing job. Um, we also have the Young Investigator Forum at that meeting the night before, but we'll also be advertising our new uh, 2023 uh, dates and meeting, which will be August 11th to the 13th at the Fairmont Austin in Austin, Texas. And this will be our combined meeting with our Young Investigator Forum, clinical course, and of course, our scientific program. We also wanna make sure that everybody remembers that we have the AMS Discovery Grant Program. We're gonna be offering two, up to two grants and the deadline is October 14th, 2022. So these grants are $30,000 each and once again, are highly competitive. So we would certainly um, ask you to uh, get your grants in on time as we will not be extending that deadline. And then last but not least, uh, next week, Wednesday, June 22nd, uh, we have another session, um, Gut Development and Neurodegenerative Disorders, and our moderators will be Art Bader and Kristen smith Edwards. So without further delay, I wanna uh, introduce uh, our two moderators tonight, um, Jason Baker and Darren Brenner, who've had a long history of working together. Uh, many of you know both of them, so we don't really need to have a huge introduction. Um, Jason Baker has really been a pioneer in terms of the allied health um, uh, component of the AMS. Um, he was a former counselor and, and really set the stage and the foundation for a lot of the educational work that we do at the AMS, focus on the allied health um, uh, uh, faculty and staff who are interested in, in neurogastroenterology and motility. And many of you also know Darren Brenner, who's actually one of my partners at Northwestern University. Darren recently was promoted um, to professor. Um, so uh, congratulations to, to Darren. And as many of you know, Darren is a world expert on anorectal manometry and constipation and anything um, in the lower GI tract, but he's also very good in the, the poor gut. So without further delay, I'm gonna hand this over to both Darren and Jason. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh... Uh, Dr. Pandolfino, very excited about this session. I think Darren and I have a similar passion about this uh, topic. First, I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Brenner on his advancement. Um, um, great job. And um, so um, we're going to introduce her, uh, our speaker tonight is uh, Kirsten Woloski from uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. She's going to give us some pearls of wisdom on uh, pediatrics and adult anorectal manometry, and we really look forward to her presentation. So Kirsten, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you for that introduction, and thank you to the ANMS to asking me to speak tonight and for everyone logging on to learn about anorectal manometry. I have no disclosures. Before we dive into anal rectal manometry, I just wanna do a little background on the anatomy and physiology to get everybody on board. And so the GI tract initially arises from endodermal tissue as early as week three of embryology. Eventually, the GI tract is derived from all germ cell layers. And interestingly, the anal canal is actually separating from what will eventually be the bladder as early as week seven of embryology. So the GI tract is actually forming very early on. Um, today, we're gonna to talk more about the lower segment of the GI tract, which is the cecum, colon, rectum, and anal canal. Together, they serve as a storage channel for the efficient elimination of waste. And what I like to go over with the families is explain that the colon is a fine tuner of water absorption and contents go back and forth on the right and they're periodically shifted over to the left side of the colon. Some of us have really efficient colons and they excretes a little too much water. And so that makes hard bowel movements. 
And then there's transit time. And some of us have really quick colons and it can move through really fast, or some of us have really slow colons. And so you may have three bowel movements a day, or you may have three bowel movements a week. And that could be normal for you, depending on your um, colon and how it works. So the anal rectum is what we're really gonna focus on today because that is what the anatomy specifically we're looking at with anal rectum manometry. So the anal rectum plays an important part in the regulation and defecation of maintenance and continence. So there are two sphincters at the bottom. So the bottom of the rectum and the anum is the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. So the internal sphincter is we do not have any control over. A ball of stool will come down to the bottom of the rectum. This movement causes stretching of the wall. And then that sends a reflex to our brain to relax the internal anal sphincter. Then the external sphincter, we have control over. So that is voluntary control, conscious control. And we decide just like your hand, you open and close it. Are we gonna then you know, sit on the toilet and defecate, um, or are we gonna hold that in until that urge passes, which can lead to constipation. So the internal sphincter, we have no control over, and the external sphincter, we have control over. And now we're gonna dive into anal rectal manometry. So techniques for anal rectal have been around for over 50 years. Um, it's now the most widely performed test for the assessment of anal rectal function. Initially, manometry was called conventional anal rectal manometry, which is depicted here on the right. And it used water perfusion catheters, and it was presented as like this pressure line data and tracings. Now, over the last, let's say, decade or so, we have, you know, technology has advanced. And this picture on the right shows high resolution manometry, and we also have high definition manometry now which converts these pressures of, uh, that we're learning about into a color contour plot. And so what we can learn from anal rectal manometry, which we're gonna dive into, is the anal sphincter pressure, the length of the sphincter, how well the reflex is working, the sensation and coordination of defecation. Equipment. So right now there are three main high resolution manometry systems there are for anal rectal manometry. There is the solar GI manometry, the ManoScan, and Insight manometry. They all involve a high resolution solid state flexible catheter. Um, and all of these catheters have closely spaced microtransducers that measure the pressure changes within the sphincter. You can see here to the picture to the left, the little silver are, are the sensors and the balloons there on the left, we actually tie on the tip of the catheter with dental floss. Um, and the size of the balloon for us in pediatrics really depends. We, we actually do it by weight. We do, if they're 25 kilos or less, we use a smaller balloon. And if they're 25 kilos or more, we use an adult balloon. And really it just depends on how much volume of air um, can be blown into each balloon um, to mimic like a bowel movement, which we'll talk about. So the solar GI manometry catheter is the one here to the left. Um, all of their catheters are 12 French. Um, again, they have the high resolution, but they also have 3D catheters, which are still 12 French. Um, and they, they have anywhere from eight to 12 sensors and gives us a lot of information. So once we tie the balloon on, we lubricate it and they lay left lateral and then it's, it's placed into their rectum. So why would we order anal rectal manometry or consider it? Um, there's different ways to classify this, but overall, the most common reasons are for suspected Hirschsprung's disease. You wanna see if you're gonna elicit a rare, um, other non-relaxing internal anal sphincter diagnosis like anal achalasia. You might be evaluating post-surgery of not necessarily just imperfect anus, but any you know, rectal surgery, if they're having, you know, persistent fecal incontinence, you might need to learn what's going on 
about their sphincter at that time. Um, you may want to be doing an awake anal rectal for disorders of defecation dynamics or pelvic floor so that you can later refer to them for biofeedback and pelvic floor PT. Um, and just assessing anal rectal function in patients with trauma, congenital anomalies, myelodysplasia, like I just mentioned, Hirschsprung's repair. Um, we also do we do it to learn about the conscious rectal sensitivity threshold in retentive and capricious. And just in general, we, you can do it to learn about the sphincter strength, squeeze pressure, um, and the patient's conscious rectal sensitivity threshold, which will make a little more sense as I go into each one individually. What does the prep for the procedure involve? So for us in pediatrics, um, we, we make sure to explain this in the office visit. Um, and in the office visit is when we do a rectal exam to really get a good understanding if the patient is going to qualify for an awake ARM. Um, but the actual procedure itself involves an enema before the procedure. We used to do it at home, which they do in the adult population, but now we do it actually at the hospital prior to the procedure because it gives us a better assessment as to how the patient's gonna tolerate it. And oftentimes parents have trouble giving an enema at home and really effectively emptying out the rectum. So for us infants under one year of age, we do a 10 ml per kilo of just saline instead of a biphosphate fleets enema. Um, this is really due more to pharmacy regulations at our institution um, due to the risk for electrolyte balance, not because we've ever had anything actually occur. If we do a 10 ml per kilo enema and we don't get a lot of results out, we will then do a pediatric suites, but we actually have parents sign consent for that. Um, ages one to two, we do a pediatric fleet and over to an adult fleet for a procedure. Um, MPO guidelines are if if it's awake, they, um, for two hours prior to the procedure, they don't have anything to eat or drink. And then if it's under anesthesia, it's per anesthesia policy guidelines. We almost always try to do awake if they're five or older. If they're an infant and you're really worried about Hirschsprung's disease, for most kids, we can really young infants under, I would say, Four to, under four to six months, we can give just a little sweeties and do the manometry. Um, and even if they need a rectal biopsy, if they are going to be moving around a lot, say six months or a year plus, then we, we may offer anesthesia if your number one indication for doing the procedure is to rule out Hirschsprung's and really what you're looking for is relaxation of that internal anal sphincter. And then you're also going to be doing a biopsy uh, if they're under anesthesia. In the adult world, um, there is not necessarily a standard bowel prep. Um, they, we're going to talk about this further too, but in the adult world, they do a rectal exam before an anal rectal manometry, the day of the manometry. Um, and then if you're doing an exam and you feel a rectal exam and you feel a ball of stool, they can give an enema, but they don't recommend an ARM right after they want you to wait at least 30 minutes. But most centers do have, um, the adult population do home enemas, about two of them, anywhere from one and a half to two hours prior to the procedure. Since most adult interactive manometries are performed awake, um, really the biggest thing is that they can take their meds two hours before and that they can have a light breakfast and then nothing until their procedure. I, I wanted to add this slide um, on procedural anxiety because I think it's really important in both pediatric and adult populations that although this is a very low risk procedure, it really does come with high levels of anxiety uh, in both, both populations and in patients and their family members who are coming with them. So like I was saying before, we try to do these awake. In peds, we do have the option to give um, an oral anxiolytic dose of either, either use midazolam or Ativan. Um, 
We try not to because that could affect the results of the study, especially um, when you're asking about sensation because sometimes they don't understand what you're saying anymore since the meds are making them a little bit loopy. Um, there's also a risk for falls afterward, you know, afterwards you have to monitor them. But if they need it, sometimes we will give it. Um, parents are present in the room. For our procedures, we have nursing, child life, parent, um, and a provider. So either an advanced practice provider or a physician is present in the room. Um, we do feel that it's important for a provider to be present to assess what's happening in the moment because with kids, they, they, their movements could really reflect a different answer on, on the study. So you need to kind of know what's going on in the moment. But our child life specialists and nursing are crucial to the success of our studies. And I probably cannot say that enough. Um, when we give the enema, our child life specialists and nurse are present and they help tell us you know, how they think this procedure may go. Maybe we need to change the order of things. Um, maybe they do need that dose of medication or what we're going to need to do during the study to keep the patient calm. Our child life specialist will assist with hospital, the hospital experience by providing emotional and developmental support. Um, we like to be as honest as possible and we use age appropriate wording. So if the child is comfortable with words like bottom or behind, um, or but, you know, we ask them what words they use at home just to make things more familiar to them and also understand our questions. Um, we provide distraction with music, videos, stress balls, um, sometimes little games on the iPad. And in the adult world, they do similar things. There's a TV, um, an iPad that can be used during the procedure for distraction. But in the adults, um, they do do a rectal exam beforehand. We try not to do that. We've done one in the office visit, but it just really adds to the anxiety, especially if they get an enema um, and we're trying to keep them as calm as possible. So we don't always do one, unless of course we're concerned for, you know, stool ball impaction, something like that. But um, it's important I know, especially in adults, not that it's not important in pediatrics, but to be assessing for trauma because abuse is real and you want to make sure that you're assessing for trauma and you're speaking to the patient beforehand of exactly what you're going to do. You don't want any surprises. You don't want to trigger any sensitive symptoms. And you also want to make sure that you have resources available in case they do bring up that they have had um, a history of abuse. It may be comforting to them if you offer them a specific gender, like maybe a female would prefer a female to do the study. So that may also be important to ask in the office visit before they're there for the procedure. Briefly on the rectal exams. So in, like I had mentioned in pediatrics, we do it in the office visit beforehand and in adults, they probably do it in the office visit, but definitely on the day of the procedure. And so when you're doing a rectal exam, first you're going to do an inspection. You're going to have them lay left lateral. And during the inspection, you can be looking at the perianal area to be assessing for fissures to see if you know, they are a constipator. Um, are there hemorrhoids, skin tags? Are, it's a great time to look if they're soiling, especially in pediatrics. You know, just if you just go to pull their underwear down, they may have leakage right there. Um, and so sometimes they, if they aren't telling you everything and they're hiding, sometimes they hide their underwear from their parents, you can tell right there on exam. Um, and so to assess the pelvic floor with a rectal exam, you can ask once you've, you know, you've inserted your finger, um, you're assessing tone at that time, and then you're going to ask them if, to do a few things. It's almost like a mini anal rectal manometry. You're going to ask them to squeeze. Um, and if they squeeze, they should I like to explain, try to use, you can feel my finger, same with the catheter when you do manometry, you can feel the catheter. Now try to use the muscles around my finger or around the catheter to squeeze and same with relaxation. Um, and so when they're squeezing, this is assessing the anal sphincter and the puborectalis. They should contract. If they're contracting appropriately, you are gonna feel the muscle lift your finger toward their navel. 
The second step is you can ask them to bear down to simulate defecation. Uh, we say things like, you know, just try to act like you're having a bowel movement. This is assessing the same thing, the anal sphincter and the pubic rectalis. They should relax um, and your finger should move toward expulsion. They should be able, they might be able to actually pass your finger. Um, third, you want to palpate the posterior rectal wall um, to be assessing for tenderness, which may be uh, congruent with pelvic floor dysfunction. Of course, if you're assessing the posterior wall, you can also be assessing if you're feeling polyps, things like that. Um, and then lastly, you can place your hand on the abdomen and ask them to simulate defecation, which we also do during the anal rectal manometry. And this gives you an idea of the strength of their core function of their abdomen, which is very important in helping to pass a bowel movement. These are the specific uh, topics we're gonna get into in a few minutes of what anal rectal manometry measures, resting pressure, erecto anal inhibitory reflex, cough, squeeze, rectal sensation, and bear down, also called push. So one of the pitfalls of anal rectal manometry is that there are not standardized normative data sets um, ac across institutions, across peds, across adults. And so the, this is the first, London classification is the first classification system for the diagnosis of anal rectal function. Um, to try to help standardize protocol data. And so there are four subtypes. There are, they've broken it down to disorders of the rectal anal inhibitory reflex, disorders of anal tone and contractility, disorders of renal, rectal anal coordination, and disorders of rectal sensation. So, these were available and still were not being used to, to the fullest. And so an international interrectal physiology working group of about 29 experts got together to really provide guidance uh, for equipment, protocol, measurements, and interpretation of interrectal manometry and balloon expulsion. Um, like I said, because of these limited standards across institutions. And so what they have come up with is this, uh, is depicted in the schematic to the left here. And so when you place the catheter in the rectum, you wanna allow for what they're calling stabilization of at least three minutes. Um, and then we do a resting pressure. They recommend 60 seconds. And then they do a series of short squeezes which is studying um, the contractility of the sphincter. And it's five, three sets of five second short squeezes with 30 second intervals of recovery in between. And that may seem silly, but this test is actually very tiring for people um, and using these muscles, it really can be tiring. So to get accurate results, you really do wanna allow that full recovery time. Um, in peds, we do things a little different, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but we, but their schematic is three short squeezes and then a long squeeze to really assess how well they can hold that squeeze for. Then they do a series of two coughs followed by three pushes over 15 seconds each, and again with this 30 second recovery interval. And then they do the rectal sensation and then they recommend the rare. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what we tend to do where I work. The first thing we do is the resting pressure. And just like I said, we allow the patient time to relax. We, we do try to give it several minutes. If we are automatically losing the child from the beginning, they're just, they really don't like the catheter in there. We may work a little quicker. So if you can see this picture here to the right is different colors here. And we, at the bottom, the color pressures here, blue is the lightest pressure. And we say, we try to tell the kids like, make it light, calm. Like blue is the ocean and the highest pressures are like a dark, deep red, purple. Um, this resting pressure example has some red and red and orange coloring in it, which in, in pediatrics, we do see. Um, they're anxious, they're squeezing their sphincter. 
um, as, as much as we try to get them to relax. In adults, there usually can be more of a relaxation period where they're calm and, and, and can really complete the um, resting pressure. We, we have them do a resting pressure for anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds. Um, if they are under anesthesia, anesthesia can definitely affect our resting pressure is usually lower than it normally would be. Um, what we use, um, again, from there, we have to probably better standardize norms. Our norms that we use are based off of studies that were done in adults. Um, and we use a norm pressure of anywhere from 40 to 90 and other centers I have seen can use anywhere from 40 to like 110. Um, they're not very different, but they're just a little bit off. Um, so if you're seeing a really high pressure in your resting pressure, you may be worried about things like Hirschsprung's disease, anal achalasia, or anal spasm. So if you're seeing really red um, and purple colors, you're, you're going to start to be thinking about those things. Um, low pressure, again, could be just the effects of anesthesia, but you're also going to be worried about spinal cord abnormalities. When you're doing the resting pressure, I'm just going to go back for a second. You can see, if you're looking at the color contour plot right now, if you're looking from the lightest, light blue, almost green to the top of the green, that is the length of the, the sphincter or the length of the canal. And so um, the computer will help you analyze this, but we, we do look to see the length because if you have a really long sphincter, it may make this more difficult for the patient to push over. And if you have a short sphincter, um, you may be thinking, do they have a mega rental? And so they've, you know, they've, their sphincter has been splayed wider and that might explain why they're having encopresis. Um, or maybe they've had anal rectal surgery and they actually have a short sphincter. And so this is also gonna explain why they might be leaking. Norms we use um, in younger babies um, would be 2.0 to 4.0. And then in the older kids and adult population, we use 2.5 to 4.5. But again, some I know some places use, use like 2.5 to 5. So still different norms at different places. Um, and so unlike the schematic we talked about from the working group, we, after a resting pressure, we do not move on to squeeze right away. We do the rare, also called recto-anal inhibitory reflex. We do that next because sometimes the children may not last as long for the study. And this is one of the really important pieces of information that we're trying to gather. So we actually do that first after the resting. And so what you're seeing here is kind of what I talked about earlier. When that ball of stool comes down, triggers a reflex for your in, internal sphincter to relax, you will see it actually relax on the color contour plot. So the first picture here, um, you can, I have kind of like an arrow here. It's like yellow and green, and then you see a little little blip, I would call it, um, or indentation here of where it relaxes. And then the picture on the right, you can see a really clear cut relaxation. And that tells you that their sphincter is working appropriately. You want to see relaxation and you're going to be significantly less worried about Hirschsprungs if you see this. The cough. So the cough reflex test um, it's, it's, it's almost like a quick way to do a spinal check on the patient. And what you should be seeing is that the anal pressure is greater than the rectal pressure. With this picture here, um, the really high pressures of red are the cough. And then at the top in the dark blue area, that's where you're looking at the balloon, but also the rectal pressure um, to make sure that that's less. So you want darker at the bottom and lighter colors at the top. Um, because the cough reflex is modulated by the spine. If they have a really weak cough, you might think that you may need to get some spinal imaging. Squeeze pressure. So the voluntary squeeze, we have them squeeze for about 
15 to 30 seconds. We usually just do the endurance squeeze, less of the short squeezes, um, but there's nothing wrong with doing both. Um, and what we like to see is that from the resting pressure that the squeeze pressure has doubled the resting pressure. That's number one, so that the contractility is working. And two, that they can hold the squeeze. So maybe they can squeeze for a little bit, but they can't actually squeeze for a long period of time, which would explain if they can't hold it and make it to the bathroom and explain leakage. And it's also something that they could focus on if they need physical therapy is really training that external sphincter to squeeze breath better. This is a really important one as to why we have the provider present in the room, because you want to be looking at what muscles they're actually using to squeeze. Similar to the, rect the digital rectal exam, I'm asking them, can you please squeeze around the catheter? This is kind of hard for a child to understand because they, you'll see them start using, they'll, they'll clench their thighs. <laughs> they'll even like clench their lower legs. Um, they'll do all these other techniques and you have to, which could still make the pressure on your screen look red, but they're actually using the wrong muscle. So you want to make sure that they're using the muscle right around the catheter um, to assure that that sphincter is actually working correctly. And then we move on to rectal sensitivity. This is really important in kids where we use what words they would use at home. What, what word do you use for poop? Um, de, you know, do you use stool, defecate? What do, what do they say to go to the bathroom so they can understand us? You're, you want to ask three things. When do they feel sensation? When do they feel just the urge to defecate? And then when is it really, really discomfort like an emergency? In the older children, we can get usually all this information. In the younger kids, sometimes they have a hard time understanding the difference between sensation and urge. I like to explain that, listen, we've put the catheter in. I know you can feel the catheter, or a lot of times we call it the tube, like the tube, because <laughs> they don't know what a catheter is. Um, you can feel the tube in there. And now tell me when you feel something different. And then tell me when you feel like you would poop. And then tell me, like, it's emergency. We will pull the car over and go to the bathroom. And we do that test at least twice because it is hard to understand and just kind of make sure that those answers are congruent with the first set of answers that they gave. Again, this really depends on the child's cognitive ability, developmental age to really understand this. And it's important to be paying attention as the nurse is inflating air into the balloon to mimic a ball of stool slowly filling up in there. And that's what the patient is feeling like a, it's fake, we call it fake poop. And they're gonna tell you these different sensations. Um, they sometimes will just say, I feel it and we haven't started yet. So it's just good to know and pay attention to if you're actually, when they're saying, oh, I feel something, was it really when you were doing the study or not? Um, and so, for us, we say a normal sensation, you should feel like a, you're slowly inserting air into the balloon, like 10 cc's, 20 cc's. Certain balloons go to 150 cc's and other balloon sizes go to 400 cc's. And so for sensation, we usually say anywhere from around 20 to 60 is normal that they should feel something different. Um, for urge, anywhere from 40 to 80. Um, and then discomfort is a little broader range from like 60 to 120. Um, and some kids can feel all of like sensation and urge and discomfort all very quickly, which may explain their urgency. And some children, you may blow the balloon up all the way and they may not feel anything. So you're just learning what signals their body is giving them in order for them to defecate. And then where can you go from there to fix that? And then the last part of that is the bear down on push. Um, and this is where we ask them to attempt to defecate, like try to push the catheter out and they should be relaxing their pelvic floor. And so sometimes we see in kids where the squeeze, which was bright red, they're squeezing, you know, high colors, and then their push looks exactly the same. And it's a good time to show the parent on the screen, like, hey, this is showing us that they may not understand how to push correctly um, because they are not creating that pressure gradient. So what you want 
is they should be having good abdominal core pressure and they should be able to relax their pelvic floor um, and relax their external sphincter. And like I just said, the inability to perform this maneuver may suggest um, a diagnosis of dyssynergic defecation. Now, again, this is done on their left side. And so it's, you know, a lot of us don't defecate on our left side. So we do other studies to really confirm or deny if the patient has disorder defecation dynamics. Um, and the other thing we do with all of our anal rectal manometries is called balloon expulsion. So we finish our anal rectal manometry study, we take that catheter out, and then we place this catheter to the left here. It, it's very similar to the manometry catheter, um, and except we put water in it. So we lubricate it, they're still left lateral, we insert it, and then we put 50 mLs. We try to have warmed water, um, just to mimic more of what a stool ball would feel like. And then we help them up to the restroom and you know, we try to tell them to sit in the proper position to defecate and give them a little stool for their feet and then time them to push out the balloon. Uh, normal is considered under one minute. But we do give them up to five minutes just to see um, if they have like a delayed reaction, if they could do it later. Um, but this in conjunction with the anorectal manometry shows us how well they are coordinating their muscles to really push their poop out. Um, we also have biofeedback, which we're not gonna get into today, um, but there's things like biofeedback and pelvic floor physical therapy that you can refer to if, if, you, if you think the patient needs help with disorder defecation dynamics. Um, and these are my references. Um, we're good. Great, great job, Kirsten. That was very well done. Um, I really liked that. Uh, all the pearls of wisdom you gave you the differences between pediatrics and adults. Uh, slightly different, the same type of test, slightly different, um, but uh, very, very well done. We have a few questions. Uh, before the question and answer session starts, we would definitely want to thank uh, Labory for sponsoring this session. Been very kind of. Um, um, sponsoring these education sessions. We really appreciate um, their kindness and support. Um, so we've got a few questions. Um, I'm gonna ask, I'll start with one. I, I, I really like the idea you talked about the importance of trauma with anal rectal manometry and anal rectal function testing. Because I think it's, um, it's one of those silent things. And most times I would agree in the adult world, you don't, you don't know the, the abuse history, if any abuse history um, of the patient. Um, just, just can you talk a little bit about the, the things you've learned from your colleagues with the, the social um, child social help things that could also help the adult population um, work through doing anal rectal manometry on, you know, abuse patients? Sure. Darren, do you want to go? Or you want me to go? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I I thought he said it. pediatric patients. Sorry, Jason. So yeah, I think this is a really important topic, and this is something I, I think that doesn't get addressed enough in, in clinical practice. And I always harken back to when I first started doing this uh, on my own at Northwestern and the mistake that I made because I wasn't initially asking patients about trauma, uh, whether it be physical, emotional, sexual abuse, those sorts of things. And I refer to patient for interactive manometry and you know, I activated a, a PTSD event. So it's something I haven't forgotten since. And I don't see this question asked a lot. And I think people are really uncomfortable asking the question. They wanna establish rapport first. I think that's really important, but I, I've been surprised over the last 15 years, how open people really are to answering the question. And I try to lead in by saying that I'm asking a very non-judgmental question as for a very binary answer, yes or no, I don't ask for a lot of specifics, but I tell them that it can really change my thought process in terms of what's going on with respects to their constipation, the types of testing I wanted to do, how I would do that testing and where we would go for treatment. And then I do ask about those types of abuse. When I get that history, I'm sure to do a couple of very specific things. Number one, thankfully somebody stole my slides from lectures years ago. So my interrupted manometry catheter is up on the web on bing.com if anybody wants a Medtronic catheter. 
It says 2009, so that's how long it's been up there. But I show the patients the catheter online. If they want to see a catheter in the lab, I'll grab one. I'll actually let them touch it, feel it, so they understand how flexible it is. And then we walk step by step on exactly what's going to happen in the process. To this point to date, I make it very clear to the individual. If it's a man, we try to match them with a, a male. If it's a woman, we always make sure there's a woman in the room performing the procedure. So there's no level of discomfort there. And I've had patients tell me either A, this is fine. I understand what you're doing. and It's absolutely okay. Or a B, I'm not comfortable with this yet. And that's where a lot of times we have to work through the trauma, the stigma, the concerns, and we engage our behavioral therapists. And in some situations, some of these patients have to undergo a few sessions of behavioral therapy before they're going to be comfortable undergoing this test. And in some more extreme cases, we've had some behavioral therapists who are actually nice enough to come in with the patient for the study. But I think your point is very valid and it's key. Before we think about doing anything like this, we have to make sure that there hasn't been an event that can trigger some sort of secondary and extreme consequence from it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that he's, we do a lot of similar things in pediatrics. Um, I will say that we are a bit spoiled with having a social worker and GI psychologist um, at hand all the time. So um, in addition to us asking those types of questions, explaining everything ahead of time, um, if we really need the child to open up more, if they're really going to tolerate this, or maybe they need a few sessions with the psychologist, we have them go to GI psychology as well. And we have a scan team to make any further assessments if needed. So just, I see a, a question came in, if I can throw this one at you, because you're kind of the expert of all things manometry, and I should give you some credit here, um, between Bill Che, but more so yourself, um, who spent a year training me on this, um, you're the reason I know how to do this, so, so some kudos have to be given there. Uh, so I'll throw okay. this question at you. So this was anonymous, it asked, can you please talk about some of the abnormalities you might see on cough, and what they correlate with clinically? Yeah, um... With cough, you know, I'm a, I'm just a big believer on it. When you almost like what Kirsten said, when you look at the screen, you show different color pressures that you want. When they cough, you want the pressure in the sphincter to be um, higher than the pressure coming down, the force coming down. And if they're opposite, it could lead to correlate with some incontinence episodes. So basically, there's a ratio, a number. We won't get into the numbers. It's a little bit monometry. I call monometry nerdy type thing when you get into the numbers. But if the pressure is higher in the in the anal sphincter canal over the pressure that's coming down, then then it really correlates with they were able to maintain continence when laughing, giggling, sneezing, uh, coughing, that type of motion. And um, for that's from the adult world, but Kirsten, from the pediatric world, when you guys do coughing, are you looking at the same type of things of maintaining continence or are you looking for something else? Yeah, not necessarily continence, more for spinal abnormalities like a tethered cord. We would do an MRI of the L spine um, to make sure we weren't missing a tethered cord. You know, what we'll do in our lab too, is I have my, my text look. I, I don't know until later whether or not there was a positive rectal anal pressure gradient, which is Jason just mentioned is gonna increase the risk of incontinence at that point. But in some of our patients, we don't prep anymore based on the, the London consensus. And so when they cough, if my text notice or they think there may be a, a gradient before it's thermally calibrated, I have them mark whether or not there was any leakage during the cough maneuvers, because I can correlate that at that point with what I'm seeing in the, in the pressure topography maps. Perfect, perfect. And Kirsten, here's a, a question that came in from an anonymous attendee. And we'd like to thank everybody that's on the call. We have really good uh, participant participation in this. We're really blessed with that. Thank you very much. Um, how will you? How high will you inflate the balloon for sensation testing in children of different ages? How do you know inside what is safe cutoff for patients of different sizes? Yep. So we base the balloon size that we're attaching to the catheter based on weight. So for 25 kilos and under, it's the smaller balloon, which can, it has a max of 150 ml of air. And then for 25 kilos or more, the max is 400 ml. There is actually another balloon um, that goes even further, but we don't actually use that. Okay. I think here's well, another one. Yeah, go ahead, Darren. I was gonna have, I was gonna ask, yeah, both of you guys probably can answer this next one, but I'll let Dr. Brown ask the next question. Okay. Uh, it was just a question is in patients with extreme sensitivity or rectal hypersensitivity, um, 
with initial inflation, do you associate that with irritable bowel syndrome? You can, I, I look at that obviously, and, and I look at not only the initial sensation, because in the adult side, some people will argue that even 10 cc's is normal. So you're not getting a balloon that big. What I kind of like to see is the pattern over time. So if somebody goes from initial sensation at 10 to I have to run to the bathroom at 30, it gives me a gradient of sensation that I can kind of match to those types of symptoms. And then I'm thinking two things. Yes, rectal hypersensitivity can be linked to irritable bowel syndrome. It can also be linked to inflammatory conditions. So if I'm worried about something like ulcerative proctitis or other types of disorders, if the patient's undergone radiation and may have a hypocompliant rectum that is now scarred down, I start thinking that that can be along that spectrum as well. So there are a few other things. And then I worry about urge fecal incontinence. Again, if you get from I sense anything to I'm immediately there and have to run to the bathroom, I worry that that can be linked to, to the urge component of a, of a fecal incontinence event as well. I don't know if either of you have any other thoughts on that. Yeah, Kirsten, how would do you do you see a lot of um, these extreme sensitivities during um, balloon inflations and and from the pediatric standpoint, how how would you um, how would you handle that? Surprisingly, we don't see that that often. It's probably what you would expect that if we inflate the kid, it's going to like jump off the table, but they don't. Um, they usually handle it pretty well. More or less, we see kids with a mega rectum. So it's actually more common that we're inflating the balloon to the max limit and they're not really since they, you know, feeling it. Um, I will say that we've had a few children that, that have had um, solitary rectal ulcer. And our plan for that is usually they have to have some type of like rectal treatment first for at least a few months before we do an ARM, because when we were doing it sooner than that, um, they were just really having discomfort and pain. And even so, uh, even if they've had treatment, it is still really sensitive for them. Okay. Here's another question I think is very interesting. And I'll, I'll kind of give you from an adult perspective what I think, then you, Dr. Brenner, can um, provide some other advice, because I think it's an interesting one. How can you tell the difference between an abnormal rare versus an anal spasm during normal rare during balloon distension study? I would say from the adult world, I think this happens, like when you talked about the protocol of doing the anal rectal manometry in the adult world, is that often it's very, very important. I think people um, buy step or get to like quick to start a session, those latency periods in between, it's 30 seconds and or coming back to baseline. So even if the 30 seconds is over and the pressure is still higher than the original baseline, you need to wait before you do another inflation for rare or any parts of the study. So I think often when you see these higher pressures during a rare, it's probably more likely you didn't wait the latency long enough to get the back to baseline. But from a pediatric perspective, uh, Kirsten, um, how would you tell the difference between an abnormal rare and a spasm during a normal rare? Do you see that in pediatrics? Um, what's your advice on that? We, we definitely see high pressures from anxiety and that they're squeezing the sphincter and that makes it harder for us to elicit a rare. Um, and we sometimes have to do higher you know, balloon volumes to actually get overcome that pressure essentially and get the patient to relax. Um, it's, it's not too common that we see a spasm during a rare. We do sometimes see spasms during the conscious rectal sensitivity. As we keep inflating more and more and more into balloon, we'll start to see some spasms. And usually we just try to wait and let it pass and then keep going. And it usually does calm down. And then we, we keep moving forward with our study. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Brenner, you have any advice on that question? Yeah, Darren, please, Jace. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, a couple of things. Number one, I think the first one is a shock to the system. I mean, we inflate to 60 cc's and most people are going to experience their initial sensation, sometimes an urge to go to the bathroom by then. And it's a high pressure um, volume that's put in immediately. It's not a slow type of taper. It's in there to stimulate distension, to get relaxation. So in many cases, it's 60 or 50 cc's of inflation. And I'll see an initial contraction that will be kind of um, uh, confluent through the puborectalis. But to your point with latencies, if you give it enough time, if you don't deflate the balloon, you'll see that relaxation. I also think that's why we make the argument that we go through six of these, right? From 60 down to 10, because by maybe the third or the fourth, when you're getting to 40 cc's, 30 cc's, 20 cc's, the patient now has a little bit under better understanding of what's going to go on, what to feel. And you lose that voluntary 
or, or volitional reflux and you start to see that relaxation. Remember, you only have to see it once. So mm -hmm. if you're noticing you're getting these spasms at 60, 50, but you see it at 40, 30, especially in an adult, the area, the rare is intact. You don't have to worry about Hirschsprungs at that point. Yeah, excellent advice, excellent advice. Let's see what else we got here. Um, this is more on the, on the pediatric side. I, I see a lot of pediatric signs or questions coming in, so I, I apologize for this, but they said, how do you describe certain manometric findings in the face of lack of normal parameters in pediatric exams, such as interrectal high resolution manometry? It's a great question. Um, and there aren't, there aren't great pediatric norms, it's true. Um, and the norms that we use are actually based on a study performed in like middle-aged women. And so we just, we're a little more flexible. We take the norms from that study and then we are just a little, we kind of allow a larger range, slightly larger, but there definitely needs to be more studies done in general on pediatrics. And there's plenty of pediatric ARMs for us to really create uh, better norms. I, I agree. You know, on the adult side, a lot of people use Adil Barucha's data, but that's based on people coming to Olmstead County, which let's be honest, is probably a little bit of a skewed population. So the argument's always been made, come up with your own norms in your area, decide what's normal versus abnormal. And people always ask me, where are my ranges and how do I interpret manometry? Well, I have a really nice slide in my decks that say with a healthy dose of skepticism and a grain of salt, because Let's say you say you're normal for baseline resting pressures. I'm just throwing these numbers out there. These aren't mine, but 75 to 100. If somebody comes in at 70 or 105, am I going to call that extreme increased baseline resting tone? No, probably not. I'm going to correlate it clinically to the patient's symptoms. But if I put that catheter in and I give the initial relaxation period, and I tell the patient to take some deep breaths and relax, and the resting pressure is 185, I can do something with that. On the flip side, if the resting pressure is hard for my tech to find, they're like squeeze again, they're not getting much and the resting tones in the 10 to 15 millimeter mercury range, I can do something with that. So little variations on the mean, I don't know if they give you a lot of information. Extremes are much easier to identify and use. I absolutely agree with uh, Darren. Even in the London consensus, they use upper level thresholds or lower level of thresholds because ultimately I think it's because we're not really sure what the normal values are generalized across all populations. So I absolutely agree with that. This is an interesting question, um, Kirsten, and I, uh, is that would you suggest using warm water instead of air during the test, especially for pediatric patients? I know you mentioned warm water for the balloon expulsion, but that's a new, really interesting question. I never really thought about it. I would say all the manometries I've been blessed to be, be a part of, we, we did use warm water. Um, mostly um, it was just because we, we, we filled the, the cup up beforehand so it's ready to go. So it came room temperature. Um, and also most of the sinks at the institutions I were on are like a governor, so it wasn't too hot or too cold. So, um, but that's an interesting question. I'd like to get your pearls of wisdom on that. Yeah, um, like you said, we do try to warm or room temperature for the balloon expulsion. I think the reason we haven't done water in these high resolution catheters is more so be of the recommendation from the company. Um, that we would have to check with them, would that affect any of the results on their high resolution catheters per se? You know, the, the, the other question, I, I, and I believe this is this is true, like especially children, pediatrics that are, has some um, um, cognitive disabilities. I think there is some, some of the children have like a, their temperature sensitive. So um, like the autistic spectrum type thing, would you think the te different temperature of the water would impact the results? Yeah, I think it could, because I can even see it on the balloon expulsion test. When we put the balloon in with the water, it seems much more uncomfortable to them than when we do the, the air. <laughs> they want to get it out right away. Yeah, I imagine. It'd be an interesting study. And off the top of my head, maybe Jason or Kirsten, you know, I can't think of any studies that looked at air versus water in a decent population. I will tell you that when we do ours, so the London classification talks about the, the bear downs in the left lateral decubitus. We actually add a fourth in the seated and we do blow up our balloon with uh, 50 to 60 cc's of air. And then we do the balloon expulsion test with water. And anecdotally, I'll tell you, I can't think of any discordant ones where if the patient passes the air 
catheter, they pass the water. My understanding of thought process has always been the water adds a little bit more volume and depth. So it gives it more of a sensation like the patient's actually trying to pass stool. But you know, honestly, between the three of us or other people on the line, maybe this is something to go back into the literature and look at and see if there are studies that differentiate whether or not there's high concordance or discordance between passing air and water filled balloons. Yeah, I'm not aware of any of that uh, for sure, Darren, but there is a there is a publication out there by um, Dr. Eric Shaw at Dartmouth. We looked at it was about pressure curves and there's oh. different pressure forces on stool, water and air, but actually passing the balloon with the different type of mediums that are in there. I'm not aware of anything in the literature on that. OK, so I think I see another question. I think, uh, again, Christopher, this is for you. Uh, the person is asking, so over 20 kilograms, you inflate all the way to 400 cc's before stopping. Do you go that high? So um, 25 kilos, but we do not necessarily inflate all the way to 400. No, it just depends if they feel the sensation or not. If they, you know, they feel sensation, then urge, then discomfort. If they feel discomfort at 120, we're done. We do it a second time just to really test our answers and make sure the child understood what we were saying. But the only time we go up to 400 is if they do not feel it, which does happen. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you see some, you see that in adults sometimes also. And I think it's very really important. One of the um, items you added to your uh, comment was on the literacy of understanding what you're um, instructing them to let you know how to do. Um, I'm a big believer on using the talk back method, you know, as you explain the tests, like what is, what you're asking them to do, what, what an urge is, what maximum tolerate, first sensation, whatever it is, before the test is over, they're able to repeat it back to you, the definition, what you're asking them to do. But I think literacy, health literacy within anorectal manometry is a little bit of a uh, concern. And um, Darren and I were blessed to be on a team who presented something at DDW as a poster last year. There was differences on literacy between what term you use, push, poop, strain, bear down, Valsava, or their personal term, they all listed it a different response. So I think literacy is a, a big component to uh, the impact of the list of response you're asking them to do. Um, um, it, this one is um, for constipation. How do you recognize, or how can you reconcile a normal defecatory pattern with an abnormal balloon expulsion test and, and vice versa? And uh, should more value for defecatory defecatory function be placed on balloon expulsion tests and manometry findings. Probably uh, have Darren weigh in first and Kirsten, you could add your opinion about the pediatric world, maybe a little bit different from the adults. So, so we know that obviously none of these are 100% perfect, which is why if you look at the Rome criteria, especially for adults, it says you have to have two abnormal tests. That being said, I always tell everybody, if you get one question on your board exams, which test uh, is going to give you the most likelihood of a pelvic floor dysfunction if it's abnormal, it's by far balloon expulsion testing. It has the best sensitivity specificity. So I put more weight into that. And again, I've looked a little bit more in the seated position on the air-filled balloon. You can have a lot of false positive anorectal manometry findings for a multitude of reasons. Extra sensors. We know that the 3D catheters with their 256 sensors, we get a lot of false positive readings. There was a, a nice study years ago where they took normal healthy individuals with no complaints of constipation whatsoever off the streets, did anorectal manometry and found that more than 85% of these patients had an abnormal defecatory pattern. The most common was, was type one dyssynergic defecation. So I will tell you personally in my clinical practice, if it's hard for patients to go for a third test like defecography, if the manometry looks okay, but they can't pass that balloon and I don't stop at one minute, I go out to three minutes. If they can't pass that balloon in three minutes, I'm more likely to directly refer them for physical therapy and biofeedback. And Kirsten, from the pediatric perspective. Um, yeah, um, I definitely agree with what Darren was saying that we the balloon expulsion holds a lot of weight. What we tend to do is we do three things when they come in for anal rectal manometry. We do the anal rectal manometry, so we're looking at you know the push, and then they do the balloon expulsion, and then they do do the biofeedback gain. And so we're kind of evaluating all three of those things, not just the anal rectal manometry, because like Darren was saying especially in, in kids, like they're laying on their left side, especially some of our teenagers are very nervous. They don't want to actually participate in that part of the study. They don't want to push the catheter out. They don't want to accidentally like poop the catheter out in front of us. You know, it's usually a whole bunch of women standing around them. Um, and most of us also don't defecate on our left side. So we kind of take that with a grain of salt. 
and then compare it to the balloon expulsion and then compare it to the biofeedback. And so if two out of the three of those things are abnormal, then we find that consistent with abnormal deficit dynamics. That's fantastic. And well, I mean, the hour has flown by. We, Darren and I and AMS would really like to uh, thank Kirsten for providing her pearls of wisdom. And, 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 you know, she's from the pediatric side, but also helped give us some pearls of wisdom on the adult side. That was very, very well done. Uh, we would like to thank Labory again for sponsoring this session. We're very blessed for their sponsorship. I'd um, like to thank uh, Dr. Darren Brenner for co-moderating this with me. And Thanks, all the Dave. questions yeah. that weren't um, answered on this, if you could go to Doc Matters um, and post your responses there, um, the conversation can continue and, on Doc Matters. Well, for all the participants in AS, we really appreciate um, everybody uh, chiming in tonight. And we look forward to the next one, which will be on pyloric physiology and gastroparesis, pearls of wisdom from an allied health professional. Everybody have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kirsten, Jason. Appreciate it.